Chapter 30, The Trin. The Tsar was uncomfortable. The small wooden golems his body rested on seemed to be made only of corners. His skin still itched, but he couldn't scratch. He couldn't move. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see Marga traveling on her back with her face exposed to the sun. She would burn horribly if they didn't find shelter soon. Pinme might too, but Tsar was not sure. The magic in that child was difficult to predict sometimes. How could they know if he was sunburned or not, if he could just conjure an illusion to hide it? Well, Markin would be able to tell, and treat him for burns if necessary. He tried to get a better look at Pinme, Morkin, Skell, and Datu. They were traveling in a line of sorts, in three uneven columns of two. When the formation turned, he could just barely see his companions out of the corners of his downturned eyes. Skell seemed fine, almost relaxed. Datu might be asleep. Morkin's posture was as, as, as expressionless as his face, and Pinme was right next to Morkin, his glow barely visible in the glare of the hot sun. In fact, Tsar noted, the baby seemed to be staring right at the sun. A beautific expression on his face. There was something very wrong with that child, or at least with the fungus inside him. Smyra was nowhere to be seen. She must have gotten away, perhaps used her fagum to keep her from getting dragged off like the rest of them. Zara wished he could predict what her plan would be next. She would try to rescue Pinmi again. Surely nothing could stop her from trying that. She was reckless, though, and might not wait to come up with a workable plan. He needed to be ready in case she tried something before the golems brought them to wherever they were going. The wooden squirrel scorpion scurried on without tiring, and as, wet, as sweat dripped from his skin, Zara realized that some of the oil was leaving with it. The tightness in his lips and cheeks was slackening, leaving his face numb but usable. His arms were still held tight against his sides, but at least he could wiggle his fingers and shift his toes. He might be able to talk soon. Perhaps, if luck was on their side, they could, still, they could stand and fight the small golems when enough of the oil had been leached away. The sound of shifting sand, tons of it, reached Tsar's ears. He pushed his head up as far as he could and could just make out a hole opening up in the desert before them. The wooden golems brought them into the hole and down a tunnel. The air was cooler down here, though still very dry, and Zara was sure he could hear the opening closing behind them as they all passed inside. The walls of the tunnel were not hardened, compacted so sand. Rather, they were loose enough to let some light through, and they shifted and rippled. It was much like the sand that had made up the humanoid golem the Trin had first sent after Zara and his crew. Was this part of the desert just another golem, but of greater proportions? If so, who was controlling it? Surely they would find out soon. Marga let out a sharp gasp. What was wrong? Zar craned his neck to get a better look, or he tried to. It felt like he was ripping his own throat open, forcing his body to move when there was still some of that oil in the skin. He got a glimpse of Marga. She was panting, and her face was screwed up, twisted in pain. Was the stress of the situation speeding along her pregnancy, encouraging the, he wasn't sure they could say child yet, to come too soon? Not necessarily. The wyvern might be going through some stress of his own, either from watching or from something happening at his end. But what would worry a 40-foot dragon who could capture human souls with his voice? Zara wasn't sure he wanted to know. What was important was that Marga might be going into labor, and there was nothing he could do about it. Hang in there, he muttered through magically tightened lips. Not that she could hear him. It grew much darker as they traveled downward. Try as he might, Zara couldn't move his arms more than an inch or so. He tried to talk to Datu or Skell, but if his voice sounded anything like the awkward mumbling they returned his cries with, there was no meaningful communication going on. Their lips were all too numb, too leached of blood. When the darkness seemed nearly complete, Zar noticed the tunnel was approaching a dead end. He could hold his head up far enough now to see the blank wall open up as, he, as they entered it. It revealed a vast underground cavern lit by a powerful light somewhere in the center. It was too bright to make out where the light was coming from, but Zara could see a vast stone floor, hundreds of feet across, with walls of that same shifting loose sand. The floor slanted down from the edges, making the entire platform seem like a giant bowl. There were concentric rings of golems standing in place to receive them. The outermost ring contained golems made of sand, dirt, or pebbles. Each was the height of a man, with humanoid figures so exact they might have been statues. They stared at Zara and company with blank orb-like eyes made from the same materials, their heads all turned to face them. The next ring was made up of glass golems, though some had, hard, had glass shards, others glass orbs, and one in particular was made from what looked like glass wires. The third ring was similar with, with golems made of metal. Gold bars, iron rods, bronze discs, and silver wires were the four types. 
That was as much as Zark could make out at first, but the squirrel scorpions were still carrying them forward down into the bowl. The golems separated at their point of entry, giving Zar a view of the three innermost rings. The next one was made up of natural materials, including, including cactus golems, wool golems, gr grass golems, and even a flower golem. After that were about a dozen large golems made entirely of weapons and chains, a sensible choice that Zar was surprised he'd never thought of in the context of golems. There were swords, morning stars, daggers, axes, maces, and even crossbows with bolts mixed in with heavy lengths of steel chain. So I could just imagine one of these ten-foot monstrosities taking on a human army. It would be able to slice their entire ranks at a time if it used those chains and blades with any degree of imagination. In this one cavernous room, there was enough power to conquer the entire might of Duskane's human armies, even to challenge the Elephant Brothers' phages. The last ring held only three golems, and each one looked different. First was a twenty-foot-high golem made out of made of every material in the room and several more. Dirt, glass, metal, flowers, weapons, silverware, wood, ice, cloth, and even what appeared to be a dead chicken. Zar suspected this golem was designed to incorporate any material it chose, which made him wonder why none of the other golems had been designed with such power. It had to be a useful one. The second golem of the last ring stood upright in a large stone vat, and Zar noticed it was growing bigger as he approached. It was made of the same lamp oil that they had all been doused with, and that oil was slowly leaking from their skin and floating back to rest in the vat. They were being freed. Zar rolled over onto his, over onto his back and took a deep breath as the numbness in his joints turned into painful cramps. He heard sighs and groans from everyone else as they experienced the same horrible sensation. Everyone except Morkin. He sat up, rubbed his arms and picked up Pinmay as the wooden squirrel course scorpions rushed off in every direction, scurrying between and around the legs of the, of the assembled humanoid golems. Pinmay didn't cry, but he didn't look happy either. The intense discomfort of the glowing infant's face was the most expressive Zar had ever seen the child. The last golem looked down at them now. It was clumpier than the rest, and gained lay eyes, and made entirely of books, scrolls, and sheets of parchment. It seemed to turn in their direction, but since it had no discernible face, it was hard to tell. A book in its head flipped open, and the creature be and the creature bent over Zar as if to help him read it. Pieces of parchment flipped up, up to cover all but a few of the words. Greetings, strange folk. The two phrases came from different parts of the open-faced pages. Then the pages turned, and a new message was selected from the words on a different page. What brings you to the... And then a single piece of parchment with one word on it covered the, covered the book entirely. Trin. There must not have been many books in this walking library that referenced the Trin by name. It was convenient, though, that the Trin had a golem capable of talking to humans, or at least humans who could read... Zar had his first question ready. It was something that had been bothering him since they entered the room. Where are the humans? The book golem flipped another book into, its, into place on its face and then began a new message. We guard their legacy. Legacy? Are they all dead? Zar asked. Yes. Skull crawled over to sit next to Zar. No humans then. Who's giving you orders? The young wizard asked. The book golem flipped to a new page. No, masters. He popped, or no, he popped another book into place. Masters. Skill was starting to speak again, but the golem had another book in place. No need. I can make decisions. I've never read about something like this, Skell cut in. Golems are rare enough in the histories, but they've always been dependent on human or elf control. Datu, looking older and more feeble than Zar had ever seen him, managed to drag his own worn frame up to where he could join the discussion. The book golem continued, now holding two books in place before their eyes and covering all but one word in each. Always improve. It then flipped the two books around. Improve always. A motto of some sort, or a distraction, or a direction from a long dead master. Zar glanced at Datu. He was likely to know more about this than Skell. No, he managed to get out. This is unique, I think. The, the old wizard turned to the book golem. How did the trend die, he demanded. The first golem, the tallest one, made out of more materials than Zar could count, reached out a hand that bristled with wires, hairs, and even a live snake. A human skull rolled down its shoulder and warmed to rest on its palm. Thin cracks spiraled out from what must have been a blow to the head, the kind often made by a mace or a morning star. Zar eyed the weapons golems in the ring behind him. Well, that raises as many questions as it answers, Skull muttered. Zar wasn't so sure. It seemed pretty straightforward, all in all. The only question left, really, was what the golems wanted. The book golem was quick to oblige his curiosity, as if guessing his thoughts. Trade with us. Skell and Datu exchanged a look but this was Zar's element. 
You want to trade, then? What kind of goods do you want? he asked. I've connections all across... I have connections all along the Mara coast and the island colonies. I can get you in contact with traders in fruit, marble, cloth, dyes, cotton, any number of things. The next word was harder for the book golem to find. It had to spell it out. S-L-A-V-E-S. Ah, so the golems were on an ego trip. The slave trade was outlawed in Ra, and as good as outlawed everywhere else. Not only was it wrong and condemned by most of the gods, for that matter, there was very little demand for slaves. A few traders made their fortune with captured fairies, though such men tended to die very young. Human slaves were more trouble to find than they were worth, with all the cheap labor available in Phylos. Still, you could find a non-trader here and there offering temporary servants, complete with contracts. Zar doubted the golems were looking for that kind of slave. Perhaps we can arrange something, Zar lied. What kind of slaves do you want? Nymph, fairy, or human? A strange paroxysm seemed to shake through the book, Gollum, flapping its loose pages and scrolls about like a leafy tree in a windstorm. Was it laughing? The tallest Gollum reached out two pole-like arms, long and thin, to point first at Finme and then at Marga, more specifically at Marga's swollen abdomen. Zar caught the wyvern's eye. There was no way the Gollums understood that there was no human baby inside Marga's womb. Who knew what they thought of Pinbe, or whether his glowing skin was a matter worth noticing to them? The book Gollum was speaking again. Young children. Why, Zar demanded, what could you possibly want children this young for? They're helpless and incapable of understanding you. Zar felt he knew the answer. These Gollums either needed some sort of work done that they could not or they would not do themselves, or else they wanted slaves for the same reason human slave masters once had in Ra's early history, as a sign of status. They wanted to demonstrate they were better than human, or perhaps just a better version of what it meant to, me, to be human. The golem shook its head as if to dismiss the Tsar's question, then switched to a different book before continuing, and the wizard. Tsar frowned. Datu seemed unsurprised. Why would you want a wizard? Skell asked. The pole-armed golem pointed up the ceiling then, extending its pole on a branch of cactus so, far, so that it reached a few feet higher. Higher. Zar glanced up at the bright point of light in the ceiling. Hadn't, he hadn't looked closely at it before. It was much too bright up there to make out any details. Cosmozo, the skull commented. Nothing happened. Cosmozo, skull tried again. Kuzarzo. What's wrong? Zar asked. I'm trying to hold back some of the light so we can make out what is producing it, skull explained. Cosm, Cosm, Cosma, and Kozar are just different kinds of light. Lesser light, greater light, and reflected or pure light. I could try... Krikosma, but it doesn't look like firelight. Krispaklama, Datu said, godlight. It didn't sound like a guess. Skell hesitated, but spoke the command. Krispaklama, zo. The light dimmed to almost nothing, but then built back into a steady stream. The silhouette of a man appeared, chained to iron hooks set into the stone arch supports of the ceiling. He was an old man, bald and beardless, with a face so wrinkled and worn that Tsar was surprised to see his chest moving, he was alive, the magical light pouring out of his skin through his ragged clothes as if they weren't even there. It's one of my brothers, Datu explained. Cry, cry, one of the Ninsa.